see the the world has a certain existence of itself you know to what extent its names and forms become appealing to you depends upon the size of the void in your life the world could be compared to a marketplace it houses stuff all kinds of stuff and you're passing through that marketplace every day the road is there the shops are lined up on either side you have no option but to pass through the road every day every evening wherever you go there are these shops lined up you know to what extent these shops become meaningful to you everything in the shop has name and form right in fact because they are shops they demonstrate and advertise those names forms quite loudly that's what they are supposed to do but do you always succumb to the advertisements when do those things assume importance for you when you have a bigger void within you so that's what i advise don't allow that void to exist it does exist do not allow it to grow too big instead live life in a way that diminishes the void if you will have a need within the world will happily come promising to fulfill the need do you want to blame the world what came first the demand or the supply the demand comes first that's what vedanta is all about why blame the supply you demanded the world supplied and the world is an infinite supplier the bigger is your demand the thicker is the supply don't allow your demand to grow big how to not let it grow big how to not allow those names forms things people shops to become too significant by filling up that void in a suitable way in the right way because the void does exist we are born with it either you plug it rightly or you allow it to become your nemesis either have the right thing in your life or become a prey to all the wrong ones you cannot say you'll have nothing in your life that's not possible you lost the right that day you were born the day you were born you condemned yourself to companionship identification a purpose either have the right company or you'll have wrong company either have the right identity or you'll fall prey to wrong identity either have a right purpose or you'll be invaded by plethora of wrong purposes don't come up and say that you are not identified with anything that's a privilege 
not accorded to you. If you if you wanted that privilege, you shouldn't have taken birth. The day you took birth, you were destined, condemned, sentenced to be identified. The best that you can have is a high identity, a sublime identity. Don't say you will have no identity. If you say you have no identity, then you are just being fooled in a spiritual way. By saying you have no identity, you are maybe just trying to protect all the false identities you nurture. Have right identity, have the right company, and have right purpose. Do not start parroting that life must be purposeless. Purposelessness is the ultimate pinnacle. Don't talk of it. It will come when it has to. It has nothing to do with your blabber. As far as you are concerned, you must have life of great and intense purpose. And if you don't have the right purpose, don't complain if life is full of wrong purposes and desires. Have the right desire if you want to avoid foolish desires. Have the right mission if you want to avoid petty errands. Getting it? Hmm? There is no substitute to hard work. If you want to avoid laboring like a donkey, labor like a royal elephant. Labor you cannot avoid. Being a donkey you can avoid. Getting it. Hmm? Those who want to avoid laboring at all become donkeys of donkeys, mules of mules. The world makes you labor so much. The world makes you sweat so much. You squirm, you cringe. It's not that you are being toasted to a feast by the world, are you? If labor you must, why not labor for the right thing? If suffer you must, why not suffer for the right cause? No? Those who don't subscribe to right causes, are they all enjoying? No, they are suffering. There is no promise that you won't suffer if you live rightly. But at least it would be right suffering. And one hallmark of right suffering is that it reduces the sufferer. Right suffering reduces the sufferer. When the sufferer reduces, how can suffering survive? How would we know if the sufferer has reduced or is reducing? How would you know whether the sufferer has reduced? You won't know. You know only when you suffer. When you don't have a headache, do you know that you don't have a headache? Right now, do you know that you don't have a headache? Do you know? You don't know. 
when you have a headache then you know you have a headache when you don't have a headache you don't know you have a headache life becomes light you don't have to keep knowing you are free of thought no so many things that concern so many other people are not material to you at all your neighbor is thinking of how to pay his son's fees don't bother you don't have a son <laughs> the sufferer has reduced the suffering is not making itself felt you have been relieved of so many concerns that plague so many people you do not want to defeat suffering you don't want to defeat the world you want to make all these things irrelevant they will exist but they will be irrelevant they will exist but they will not exist to you so as you pass through the street the shops exist but are irrelevant that's what you want that's an indicator of freedom from suffering it exists but is irrelevant are there adverse situations is yes, they exist but they are irrelevant at least they are not as relevant to me as they are to other people as they are not as relevant to me today as they were two years back i can sleep i'm not continuously thinking i'm not bug i'm not under the yoke i don't have to till the field of suffering carrying the yoke the thing is but not for me and then with A mischievous smile. The Rishi asks, "Does it really even exist? If it exists, but not to you, does it really even exist?" And then you realize how the seers could say the world does not exist. At a physical level, at the vyavharic level, the world always exists. But when it becomes irrelevant to you, then you can say jagat mitya. to me it does not so and there is the choice is between choosing a higher suffering or higher problem versus choosing multiple small sufferings so how can we be sure and confirm that this higher suffering is worth taking and the smaller sufferings are not worth taking so what gives this supremacy over smaller suffering dignity what do you want to die fighting a million mosquitoes or a mighty tiger how do you want to be remembered or known even to yourself Hmm? what do you want to be written on your samadhi hmm?
fell prey to a million mosquitoes. Yeah. Your nature is large, infinite, brihad, brahm, immeasurable. You won't like to be known or seen encumbered with mosquitoes. When you're a soldier, a born soldier, you'd want to die on the battlefield. Yeah? You'd want to have a death that behoves a martyr. You won't want to be run over by a, a truck because you were lying on the road in your drunken state. What an inglorious death. See, there are certain things without reason. It's just that you cannot like these things. Given your human form, you just cannot like pettiness. Otherwise, why are some deaths considered higher than others? Why are some dead people called martyrs and the other dead are just dead people? Why? Because your consciousness aims for that which is high, beautiful, pure. And the proof of that is you ask questions. If you do not want purity, which is clarity, why would you ask even this question? Tell me please, why did you ask this question? The fact to ask this question is proof that you have a consciousness that wants elevation. Clarity, purity. Hmm? Therefore, you cannot enjoy pettiness. If you have to argue, would you want to argue with a fellow whose, whose brains have been eaten out? By mosquitoes? Would you enjoy arguing with such a person? Hmm? Who cannot even comprehend your arguments? No one wants victory in arguments, no? But would you even want victory over such a person? No. You would rather prefer to be defeated by a scholar. By somebody who really knows, no? Rather than prevailing over a dimwit. That's the nature of our consciousness, and there's no reason to that. That's the way it just is. We are not petty, and we cannot be satisfied with pettiness. If you'll ask why, I'll say because that's the way we are. There's no reason there. This, that's just the reality, without reason. Hmm? Or if you'll insist, I'll say truth is the reason. You come from truth, therefore nothing short of truth suffices to satisfy you. 
thinking of this and what you have just said and and then when one thinks of the world and the common culture nowadays we see that pettiness and the forces which propagate pettiness they are very fast quickly becoming the norm maybe that's where my question also came that you know what is wrong with being petty in a way no the, if it doesn't if it if it doesn't uh, make you puke it cannot be explained to you what is wrong with it dirt filled meanness pettiness are just not things your consciousness can agree to and if you force yourself by training yourself wrongly you subject yourself to deeper misery it is that when things get deep they also get hidden the deeper your misery is the danger is the more hidden it would be that's why you require an upanishad otherwise misery would have been its own antidote no like newton's third law more the action more the reaction more the misery deeper the resistance to misery but that does not happen the deeper the misery the lesser is the resistance to misery because the misery itself takes away your ability to resist it that's the danger with learning to tolerate the wrong kind of suffering for too long if you have been tolerating nonsensical suffering for 10 years 20 years the danger is you will become acclimatized and you will lose your resistance to suffering then then you require good company then you require upanishads then you require somebody to shake you up to slap you hard and remind you that you are not born to suffer that you must at least not make peace with the one who makes you suffer at least resist at least don't worship the ones who make you suffer 